And Nabila Ekstabalan is Walmart Can Canada's Chief Operations Officer. She oversees the operations and performance of Walmart Canada's 400 stores, serving more than 1.5 million customers daily. Nabila is one of the Globe and Mail Report on Business's 2022 top executives and has nearly 20 years of leadership and business development experience with Walmart, Ikea, and Starbucks Coffee. Nabila has a dual degree in marketing and supply chain management and distribution, and a master's in industrial and organizational behavior and design. She is also a certified executive coach. Thank you so much for joining us today. Over to you, Nabila. Assalamu alaikum, uh, Max Scholarship winners and family members and community members. It's an honor and a privilege to be with you all today. And I want to take my time um, with you all to talk about success. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, um, you know, I have been blessed in many ways, big and small, personally and professionally. And if you took a look at my LinkedIn profile, most people would say that I've been wildly successful. And I hope in this crowd, you would also say, mashallah. Um, at just 20 years old, I was running a $1.2 million business. At 26, I was running a $130 million business. And at 29, I was responsible for a multi-billion dollar business. I'm the only female COO at Walmart today and only the third ever to hold the position. I've sat on the board of a Silicon Valley startup that I was able to expand globally. And I've had the opportunity to travel the world and live in four different countries. I sit on boards, I speak at conferences, I get to meet a lot of important people, but most importantly, I have a beautiful family who love me and who support me through it all. At the same time, I come from a family of small means and I had to work full time 50 hours a week to pay my way through university, writing a $12,000 check out of my own pocket every semester. I've struggled my entire career with work-life balance. I've struggled with postpartum depression, and I've fought a battle with anxiety for many years, one which I work on actively every single day. And surprising to many, I'm actually very introverted, more introverted than I am extroverted, and I need a lot of time to rest and recover after social interaction, which is basically what I do every day. I've battled mom guilt, imposter syndrome, bias in the workplace, racism, you name it, I've been there. And these are the things that you don't see on a LinkedIn profile. These are the shadows of a lot of professional success and achievement. So as you embark on your journey as young adults and as students, I want you to challenge the question I want you to challenge and question your definition of success. Now, I get it. I'm the child of immigrant parents who gave up everything and escaped war to give me opportunity that they didn't have. And like most first generation children and immigrant children, there's this external and internal pressure not to squander that cherished opportunity. But over the last decade, as I've reflected deeply on success and what it is and what it isn't. And during that journey, what I've learned and realized is that the answer has been right in front of me the entire time. The answer is, was given to me five times a day and I've been hearing it my entire life. Hayyal salah, hayyal salah, hayyal falah, hayyal falah. Hasten and hurry to al salah and hasten and hurry to success. Sorry, I get a little emotional talking about it. Um, now, I'm not here to tell you that, you know, you don't need these scholarships and drop out of school and just go pray a thousand times a day. Like, that's not what Islam teaches us. But what I am going to tell you is that there's no true success without the foundation of spiritual success. It's in how we carry ourselves as Muslims of excellence and how we pursue our education and our profession within the realms of Islam, protecting and prioritizing our ibadah. So as you embark on your journey, 
widen your definition of success. Think of it as multidimensional, both in this life and the next. Define your success in more domains than just professional and educational achievement. Yes, we all want to feel successful in whatever we pursue, but we need to pursue spiritual success by prioritizing our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our state of spiritual health. We need to pursue mental and emotional success, caring for your emotional and mental health. We need to pursue relational and social success, as Azar was talking about, and caring for the important relationships in our lives, our families, and our communities. We need to pursue environmental success, caring for the environment and the world which has been given to us as an amana. We need to pursue physical success so that we have the strength and the forewithal to go through life's tests and have the health in other aspects of our lives. So my challenge to you as you all sit down and pursue your futures and everything that's ahead of you is reflect deeply on what you want to achieve professionally, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, socially, environmentally, and physically. What do you want your success to look like across all of these domains? And when you sit down to define these things, it makes every other decision you're gonna make easier. When you sit down and define these things, it makes it easier to keep balance across all the domains in your life. My reflections of success led me to defining what I call my baseline. It's a list of things that I will not compromise on no matter what. So I wanted to share my personal baseline with all of you. It may seem overly simple, um, but these are the things that I know I have to protect. So first and, foremost, first and foremost, it's my spiritual health, which means making my prayers on time, doing my sunnahs, and participating in some congregational religious activity on a weekly basis that fills my spiritual bucket. It means eating all my meals on time and not skipping them to do work or chores, maintaining my sleep schedule and having restful uninterrupted sleep, having breakfast or dinner with my kids every single day, working out three times a week, going outside and enjoying nature and all Pantau's creations at least once a week, making time for the things I enjoy that are not work related, like reading or spending time with family or friends, and limiting my exposure to negative news and social media. I've learned how important it is to pay attention to what I pay attention to. And last but not least, protecting true time to rest and reflect and do the things that recharge me. Now I use this list very literally. I have it printed in multiple places, and I reflect on it at the end of every week. And I ask myself if I was able to, to maintain it. And if I struggled in one of the, the areas, I paused and I changed something about the next week so I could course correct. When I'm given an opportunity professionally or personally, I actually sit down and ask myself, can I maintain my baseline and do this opportunity? And I have literally turned down promotions or said no to board seats or said no to lots of requests on my time um, as a result of the fact that I knew I couldn't do those additional things and protect my baseline. So having this wider definition of success has given me the confidence in knowing that what about knowing what is important and protecting the things that are most important to my, in my life. You would never be late to a meeting with your boss or a prime minister, or a person of significance. Think about how you're showing up for these important people versus how you're showing up for yourself and for your family, and most importantly, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that society has conditioned us to prioritize professional and educational and financial success at the expense of other dimensions of our lives. My hope for all of you is you question this that you think deeply about it and you broaden your definition of success. Having a great job and a great salary doesn't feel like success when you're also struggling with your mental and emotional health. Having a PhD doesn't feel like success when you haven't seen your family in months or struggle to maintain family ties. 
Now, this broader definition of success may mean that you take things more slowly or that you're more measured. And in my opinion, that's a trade-off worth making. So all successes from all of Montala and all eras are my own. I share this advice with myself first and foremost, as I share it with all of you. And I wish you all endless success to all our scholarship winners and their families and all of your endeavors, both in this life and the next. I think now we're just gonna open up for a few questions, inshallah. Thanks so much, Nabila. That was incredible. Um, there's a lot that we can learn. And in fact, uh, if you could share your list again with us, that would be great. As a few of us didn't catch everything, I did not write it down and would really appreciate that. Um, if you could share it in the chat before you leave, something like that, we would write, take that into consideration and maybe uh, find a way to uh, promote that list. I think it's uh, it's really, the, the things that you listed were really, really important. We do have a question here about what, what led you to, to be part of a company making a million bucks at 20? at the age of 20. So it's uh, it's actually quite simple. I started at Starbucks Coffee um, making $6.50 an hour as a 16 year old as a barista. And by the time I was 20, I was running the business. I was running a store. So a, a Starbucks operates around $1.2, $1.5 million. So I was you know 18 and some years old and some change running a Starbucks coffee business by myself all day, you know, 45, 50 hours a week and going to school at night. And then that one store turned into 20 stores and turned into 600 stores. And by the time I was in my mid twenties, I was running $130 million bid p and um, And it's just grown since then. That's great. And with all the things that you listed sort of, what, what do you do when you feel so overwhelmed that you're not even able to follow your own list of how to take care of yourself? Yeah, so that's the daily um, struggle, right? And I think that's what the baseline is intended to do is to hold yourself accountable. And, and what I would also suggest is to share the baseline with people in your life that can also hold you accountable. So family members and friends. So there's a system in place to hold yourself accountable. So if you start to veer off that list, you can course correct. And it happens at times. There's crazy weeks or a crazy series of weeks but that is the center of gravity. It always pulls you back and allows you to reset. So I think part of it is just being forgiving to yourself that, you know, it is a constant journey. And I think in this journey of, of trying to find balance, we do have peaks and valleys, but there's always a way to come back and, and reset and just never losing that. Like you, there's never, you never give up in trying to find that balance. And we know that the best way is the middle way. So it's just a way to keep you in the middle and keep you balanced in every aspect of your life. Or at least that's how I've used it and what it's done for me. No, that's wonderful. I don't know if you're able to read the chat while you speak, but um, there is a suggestion that you should write uh, a book about your journey through life. Uh, your journey has been, it's, it's amazing and it's quite inspirational of you to be able to speak so frankly and honestly about your experiences. Aside from you doing all these incredible things uh, in the professional sense, what is one thing that you like to do personally? Um, like, you know, some of us like to travel, some of us like to uh, bike or hike. What's one thing that you like to do on for yourself? Uh, so I have a lot of personal, you know, uh, things that I love to do. Traveling and reading are two. Um, hiking, uh, being outside. I love the mountains. Um, being in nature is really important to me. And um, it does a wonders for our mental health and physical well-being. So uh, that's those are things that are really important to me. And I will say my superpower is also sleep. I think as young people, you might underestimate the importance of sleep, but the science is there. We know this importance of it. I think really protecting my sleep um, is really critical for me as well. So a lot of times my favorite thing to do on the weekend is, is sleep. <laughs> so... Thanks so much for uh, dealing with us. Uh, thanks so much for sharing that. I do. I did miss a few questions in the chat. Uh, the first one is, how do you deal with imposter syndrome and working as a Muslim woman in a multi-billion dollar company? Yeah. So, I mean, I don't, I don't have imposter syndrome anymore. Um, I would say that I'm, I'm very confident confident in the, my skills and capabilities today. Alhamdulillah, that's something that's grown over time. But when I was younger, 
um, it was definitely something I was plagued with and uh, predominantly because I was quite young. I was usually the youngest person in the room. I was usually the only female in the room and I was de definitely the only Muslim female hijabi in the room. Um, and I think when I was younger, I just overcompensated with trying to know more, do more, be faster, take on more. And that's a dangerous um, method of trying to compensate for imposter syndrome. That's part of kind of what le led to overworking myself. What I would say, my so I don't recommend doing that. What I would say today when I, I think about um, that question is ask yourself, what's the opposite of imposter syndrome? So imposter syndrome is the voice in your head that says you're not qualified, you're not capable, you shouldn't be there. There's another voice in your head that says you are capable, you are confident, and you should be there. Name that voice, foster that voice, encourage that voice. And when you have a choice to either believe the voice of imposter syndrome or that other voice that does tell you that you, you have the right to be there and you're just as capable as everyone else, choose that voice. It's just a, it's a choice. It's the same thing like when, when um, I get asked, you know, how do you share things that, and, that are, can be vulnerable because it's hard to be vulnerable because it feels like you're exposing yourself. I choose to believe in people's compassion over their judgment. There's going to be people who judge me, but I just choose to ignore them. And I choose to believe in people's compassion over their judgment. I choose to believe in the voice that tells me I belong here than the voice that tells me I don't. It's a choice. That's great. I think we are running out of time, but I did want to ask one of the questions in the chat about how do we remind ourselves of the bigger definition of success? Sometimes we focus a lot on how much money we make and that um, dictates how successful we are, but that's really not the definition of success that we should be focusing on. So how do you, and what do you sort of do to remind yourself of this is, this is the broader definition, this is the bigger picture? You are more than your job. You are more than the income you earn. Um, and so I think literally write it down. And that was my challenge to you all. Sit down and write down what you want in your success to be across all dimensions of success. Read it every year. Remind yourself of it. Post it somewhere. Give it to someone who can remind you of it when you get a question or challenge that you have to face. Measure yourself against it. Create an accountability system around it. But I really want to encourage you guys to sit down and reflect on your journey across all these dimensions in life and not solely pursue professional and educational achievement because our lives are not just what we do and how much money we earn. And I think we all know that that's why you guys are here. So I just challenge you to kind of double click on it and reflect on it and write it down and read it to yourself and share it with others. And that way, inshallah, you keep yourselves, um, you hold yourselves accountable to that broader definition. That's great. Thank you so much. There's a few other questions that we didn't get the opportunity to to get to, but on behalf of everyone, thank you so much for these inspirational words, uh, the the honesty that you brought to your remarks, and and just being able to to be transparent and open with us about your journey as you went from you know your academics and after your academics, and here you are, such a a leader, a Canadian Muslim woman leader that um, a lot of us look up to.